You know, there is a Bible pattern. There's a Bible pattern for preaching. And as I said, it's we, we read a, a little snippet from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But there's a pattern in the Bible, in the New Testament, in many areas, including preaching, the Bible pattern is involvement. A lot of times this pattern has been set aside. Now, I'm not opposed to large churches. One of the most beautiful places I've ever been was in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, Huntsville, Alabama, Pepper Road. Athens, sorry. I'll get the right place. I know it's in Alabama. But uh, uh, Celia's brother and sister-in-law go down there to Pepper Road. And I've got a friend that preaches down there at Pepper Road. And, uh, you know, when you get together with 300 people, 300 like-minded Christians, the singing is beautiful. But I'll tell you the thing that I see challenging in a congregation of that size. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not opposed to it. I thought it was just wonderful uh, to be down there, and it was very uplifting and encouraging. But there's something that is to be said for involvement. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and other passages as well, but I don't have time this morning to look at all the other passages, but just look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 with me for a moment. And I'm not saying that this all has to be done um, in, 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 that, that every single person has to be active in every single assembly. But I want you to notice the pattern that is put forth here. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. And we read, we read just this verse a moment ago. But he says, What then, brothers, when you come together... Each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Then Paul says, let all things be done for the edification or building up, the ESV says. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three. And, let e and each in turn. And let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them Keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak. Let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For if you all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirit of spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. We'll leave that there. But you see how, how there is a pattern of involvement Two or three. Think about it for a moment. Now I know that I'm a long-winded preacher. And I get some comments once in a while. Well, that lesson was awfully long. Usually it's coming from one of my daughters or, or my wife. But imagine if we had two or three preachers. Or two or three people who wanted to speak. And so... We, we usually set things in an orderly manner in which a time frame is set. And I know that you may not believe this, but I can do a shorter sermon. But nevertheless, my point is this. It is more edifying the more involved we have. We have, right now, we have not too many people. And so everyone is pretty much involved at every service to some extent or another. But I think it's good that people are involved. You also notice the structure that Paul wants things to have. Now, I have been through the Bible cover to cover, and I don't necessarily see a complete pattern for exactly uh, the, you're to pray, you're to sing, you're to... 
there's all these elements, but they're never in a format. We've kind of put them in a format that is easy for us to follow and understand. Again, if someone has a format or sees a pattern in the scriptures to how we're supposed to worship, I'd be interested in that. Preaching should not be, I've got just, this is the last point. And I've mentioned this throughout, but I think it's so important. It's so important for us to listen to this. Our preaching, there are certain things that preaching should not be because they are not edifying. Preaching should not destroy, tear down, or weaken the body of Christ. Okay, if our preaching, if my preaching, if my preaching is tearing down, if I'm here to destroy somebody, if I'm here to weaken the brother, to divide, to pit Christian against Christian, to make someone question their salvation, then I'm not doing my job. This is not what Jesus would have me to do. James in James chapter 1 and verse 19 says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and ram rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted or engrafted word which is able to save your souls. There's a, there is an idea here of being slow to speak. I know that might be rather amusing coming from someone who does the preaching. But it is something that I've taken very seriously in my life. Is not to be very quick to speak. A lot of times there'll be a question and I will tell you that I have to get back to you on that question. If I don't have a ready answer. Because I take very seriously the responsibility of, of speaking the truth. Whether it's in Bible class, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one area, or whether it's in a sermon. I do not speak hastily about anything because God does not want haste. Haste can destroy. Unintentionally, but it can destroy. I've personally seen men use pulpits just like this one as a way of lashing out at other people. And I've personally seen congregations destroyed because of it. I've seen congregations fracture, split, and completely dissolve because preaching was not what the Bible intended. One last passage comes from James chapter 3. James chapter 3 and verse 1. And this is a caution more to the young men here than to anything. It is a caution to preachers. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. Now that sounds really odd. Wouldn't we want everyone to be a teacher? Paul seems to think that everyone should be a teacher. And yet James says not many of you should become teachers. And he explains... He says, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Disclaimer right now. I know that in the past I have stumbled and I have spoken incorrectly from time to time. It is not intentional. But it is something that I will have to answer for. And I will ha have to answer to God with greater strictness than he's going to judge someone who does not preach. He says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Able also to bridle his old body. Then he goes on with the tongue and what an evil thing it can be. Preaching should not be that way. Preaching should not be evil. 
Preaching should not destroy, tear down, or weaken the Christian or the church. Hopefully that's been an explanation of why we preach, maybe a little bit on how the Bible teaches us that preaching should be conducted. But as Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation. If you're here today, you're subject to the invitation in any way, I want to encourage you to make your wants and wishes known as we take out our song and turn to song number 23.